I'm Paul van der Heining. I'm a chairman and professor of the University Department of Otolaryngology and Head and Neck Surgery in Antwerp at the Antwerp University Hospital. And right from the first days, we were involved in the trials of electroacoustic stimulation, trying to preserve the residual hearing in patients. We present now our way of approaching and the points that we feel are essential to keep the residual hearing and in a modern perspective also to do structural preservation search. Our technique starts before the surgery and so we will discuss what we have to do preoperatively during the surgery and also after the surgery. Preoperatively, patient counselling is an essential element. We need to involve our patients to make the right choice. Choice on which electrode to use, why we use these electrodes, and what is the proper length of these electrodes. We have to assess the anatomy of our patient. We, for instance, CT scan and using technology like Otterplan to assess the cochlear duct length and to choose the electrode appropriately in order to have a maximum chance of preserving the residual hearing and the structural preservation. We feel that it is necessary that vaccination for pneumococci has been done before the surgery. And then we need to treat all infections and inflammations, especially in the head and neck region, before we do the surgery. So we look for oral hygiene, chronic upper airway infections. We will use what we can to get a normal ventilated middle ear. And it is the custom that if children have gluis that we first place transtympanic drains and wait for two months to get an optimal anatomical condition of the middle ear to do this surgery for hearing and structural preservation. Indeed, if we operate in an inflamed environment, then the chances of getting also inflammatory reactions in the inner ear is higher and that's we want to avoid at every price. Then there are the corticosteroids. This is for the surgery of prime importance. When I look through all the studies, also experimental, it is clear that giving corticosteroids is beneficial in keeping the residual hearing and the structures. Corticosteroids takes a long time before they penetrate well in this lymphatic compartment. Moreover, when you apply corticosteroids, it will take eight hours at least for the cells to express the effect of these corticosteroids and to have the effect of the glucocorticoid uh, receptor uh, stimulation. So the last moment to give the corticosteroids is at the induction of the surgery, but it is even better to start with the corticosteroids the day before the surgery. There's a lot of debate what is the optimal way of giving the corticosteroids, but we will start it before the surgery and give a course of 10 days tapering off the corticosteroids. We also will give the patient antibiotic prophylaxis and in our center we'll continue it as a therapeutic dose and this is not just for middle ear infections because prophylaxis would be enough but we want to avoid also inner ear reactions and we prolong the therapy for eight days. Then during the surgery we have the custom to use in our cooling solution for the drilling and to remove the dust, also to put cyprofloxacin in this cooling substance so that we have a maximum eradication of organisms in the middle ear. During the drilling we collect the bone and the dust and we use it afterwards by stabilizing with fibrin glue as a substance to fix our electrodes so that there is no movement of the electrodes afterwards. The long life of an implant is dependent of good implant stabilization. 
To do that, we need a tight pocket. We draw on our drapes the contour of the pocket as we conceive it for the patient, and that allows us during the surgery, when we do the dissection of the pocket, to make a small, tight pocket that fits well the electrode, and that also leads to less mobilization and movement of the implant. And now we do the standard antromastoidectomy. We will uh, detect the incus as a reference, and it is important during this mastoidectomy to create a very thin posterior canal wall, because at the moment that we are going to the round window exploration, we need a tangential view in this area, and a thick posterior bony wall will impede our view. Whatever colleague you discuss with on the key points on structural preservation is a good access to the round window region and to have a wide posterior tympanotomy. So it pays off to take your time to enlarge your posterior tympanotomy to the maximum and now you have more freedom of movement with your instruments when dealing particularly with the round window area or doing a cochleostomy and manipulating the instruments and especially the electrode insertion. Once we have done the posterior tympanotomy, we apply also topical corticosteroids. We prefer the use of creamcinolone. We use it because it also is crystalline form and gives a longer exposure after the surgery. We avoid any dust in the mastoid, any dust in the tympanic, in the tympanic cavity, and especially we remove the dust around the crura of the stapes, because between this crura often some bone dust is trapped, and this will lead to some conductive hearing loss after the healing of the surgery. So we have to clean thoroughly the middle ear cleft. Then when looking at the right spot of inserting the electrode, we need a nice view on the round window membrane. In order to be able to visualize optimally this round win window area, we have to remove the bony lip overhanging the round window niche, and this to a level that we can see the first, the anterior two thirds of the round window membrane, and we will later perforate the round window membrane in its anterior inferior part. If for another reason we cannot do this round window approach due to anatomical constraints, we will do a cochleostomy. The cochleostomy has to be done far anterior and inferior of the round window membrane, and not as sometimes is seen on some drawings anteriorly to the round window, because then you touch and break the basilar membrane and the osseous spiral laminae. The more you are anterior inferiorly, the further you move away from this critical structure that absolutely we don't want to harm. Personally, we've not a good experience in hearing preservation by using a round window membrane and extending it by drilling the anterior inferior margin. When we cannot use a round window membrane insertion, we prefer to go right away for low inferior cochleostomy instead of enlarging the round window area. Here we see again in more detail the anatomy of the round window membrane and where it is clear going anterior inferiorly that you go away from your basilar membrane but still, there's a lot of evidence that just passing through your round window membrane is the best way of doing. By not harming the endosteum of your scala tympani, you avoid new bone formation. Going by cochleostomy always will induce some form of ossification, which is not the case if you pass through the round window membrane. Next steps. Next step is to prepare then the implant bed and it is also essential to firmly stabilize the implant. There are several ways and in this lecture we're not going into detail but we will use the pin system 
and very importantly we make a sleeve to put in the electrode so that the electrode is embedded in the bone it stabilizes the implant but also it protects the electrode for later impact this is critical also for children and will reduce substantially the number of electrode breaks at a longer period of time once the implant is in place we will protect the electrode and keep the electrode into the plastic tubing as it comes out of the package because we do not have dirt or blood on the electrode so we keep it in this safeguard of this electrode tubing until the very end before inserting the electrode we remove the bone dust we rinse it closely we change gloves we clean even the tape the drapes so that the risk of introducing bone dust or whatever on the electrode in the cochlea is reduced as much as we can do when the implant is in place and the electrode in is its sleeve we will coat the electrode in this sleeve with helon and with corticosteroids and now we do the last preparation of the round window if you feel that there's a large distance between the round window and the low facial recess then we make a kind of a bridge and we use for instance a piece of a glove that makes a bridge between the posterior panotomy and the round window membrane so that it glides the electrode tip and stabilizes the electrode tips to get introduced into the scala tympani. We will cover the round window before opening it so that with an under immersion type of insertion an underwater type of insertion of the electrodes because studies have shown that the pressure changes in your scala tympani are reduced when there is some liquid overlying the opening of the round window membrane. You need to open the round window membrane in a wide way, not just puncture it, but we want a wide opening for allowing perlymph to get out. When we induce the electrode, then there is of course a volume replacement. We want to avoid that there is a sudden pressure increase in the liquid, in the perleaf of the scala tympani, that we are kind of mini tsunami in the cochlea. And so by introducing the electrode, we need room for the perleaf to flow out. This takes time. And therefore we advocate to do a very slow electrode insertion over a period of one and a half minute to two minutes. Once the electrode is in place, then we close the round window just by some overlying fat tissue, without any pressure, without any firm handling, just laying it around and fixing it glue with fibrin glue. Even it might not be necessary to do that, but in order to impede infection from the middle ear to the inner ear, in case of an infection, we prefer that there's some protection, so we use some fat tissue to do that. We fix then the electrode with this bone pâté. There are different ways of doing it. We use bone pâté. It is the bone dust. We collect it during the mastoidectomy, mix it with fibrin glue, and it gives quite firm stabilization of your electrode. At the posterior tympanotomy, in the mastoid cavity and we close also the mastoid surface so then by at the end when we close the wound that there's no contact between the skin and the subcutaneous tissue and the electrode within the cochlea also we want as least movement of this electrode as possible then we come at the end stage of the surgery and we give a firm hand bandage so there is no fluid or seroma coming between the skin and the implant. We ask the patient not to blow their nose because there are some instances by blowing the nose that air is coming in the mastoid and even under the implant. And especially patients that are on CPAP therapy, we ask them to use a pressure like a sport headband during 14 days. 
Afterwards, for the long life of your residual hearing, inflammation should be reduced. That means hygiene again, treating infections, and of course, no smoking. We all know that the outcome of middle ear surgery is poor when people smoke. This is also the case for residual hearing. And we hope at a long time, but this is not for the moment available, that slow drug disease substances might decrease the long-term deterioration of your inner ear function or inner ear structures. Nevertheless, using this technique and the last publication show that the residual hearing might be well conserved for a long time. So we have discussed our technique or surgical technique to preserve residual hearing during cochlear implantation. And so I summarize again the main elements of the surgery and the main points that we feel are essential to keep the residual hearing and to have structural preservation. We have to prepare the patient and choose for the right electrode. All publications show that flexible lateral wall electrodes have better hearing preservation and stay in the scala tympani and not migrate to the scala vestibuli. Preoperatively, we should start with corticosteroids, and in my opinion, you should prolong them for 10 days. All studies support the use of these corticosteroids systemically. This can be added to the topical application of corticosteroids. When doing the surgery, you need a delicate type of surgery and a very clean type of surgery, so that there are no microorganisms, bone dust, blood, entering the cochlea. When approaching the round window membrane, it is essential to do this in a gentle way, in the same way as you would do otosclerosis surgery. This means no aspiration of perilymph and staying away from the basilar membrane. If any way possible, round window insertion yields better results than other ways of doing even anterior low cochleostomy. But in case you need to do a cochleostomy, you, do, you have to do it in this anterior inferior low localization. When inserting the electrode, this has to be done in a very smooth way and taking also your time. Insertion times of two minutes are to be advocated because you allow the pear lymph to flow out of the scala tympani without pressure increases into your scala tympani. And then afterwards, when the electrode is in place, good electrode stabilization enhances the effect and long-term effect in these patients. And last but not least, after surgery, for long periods of time, Treatment of any head and neck inflammation is to be advocated and please refrain from smoking. I think these are at this moment the elements that maximize your chances to keep residual hearing and structural preservation. I thank you for your attention.